Thank you so much for joining us tonight for bears, bobcats, moose, mink, and more. Oh, and don't forget the cougars. <laughs> We're really delighted to have you this evening as we kick off Northeast Wilderness Trust Spring Speaker Series with esteemed guest Susan Morse. We also have here with us tonight Bob Link. Hi, Bob. Hello. And we're co-hosting this program with Blue Mountain Wilderness Alliance. I know many of you here in the crowd tonight are a part of Blue Mountain Wilderness Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us and being a part of this program and a part of the effort to protect Blue Mountain in Rygate, Vermont, which we will get into just a bit. Uh, so first I wanted to introduce Northeast Wilderness Trust. Northeast Wilderness Trust is based in Montpelier, Vermont, but we work across New England and the Adirondacks. We work to protect forever wild landscapes. So these are places where that won't be logged. They are first and foremost places that are nature's for nature's sake. And to date, we've protected 64,000 acres from the Adirondacks all the way over to Maine and all the way down to Connecticut, most recently with the purchase of 6,000 acres as the Grafton Forest Wilderness Preserve in Maine. So we're excited to share that success with you. And we've got some active projects happening that we're fundraising to protect some new lands. Um, and one of those is the Blue Mountain Wilderness Sanctuary that we are working to protect in Vermont. Um, and I just want to share with you about the Blue Mountain Wilderness Alliance, which is co-hosting this program tonight. They are a small but growing contingent of wildlands advocates in and around Rygate, Vermont, who support this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to help conserve as forever wild a large privately held contiguous tract of diverse and pristine woodlands to be known as the Blue Mountain Wilderness Sanctuary. Their goal is to help educate and inform the local and regional communities of the significance of this natural resource and to help fundraise with Northeast Wilderness Trust in support of permanently securing and safeguarding these important lands as a wilderness sanctuary. So I'm going to invite Bob Link to tell us a little bit more about um, this landscape. Uh, those of you that are in the Rygate area know it well, I'm sure. Um, it's certainly an iconic feature in the Upper Valley, Northern Upper Valley landscape. Um, it has some amazing uh, Northern White Cedar Swamp on the property and it, it ascends to the height of the peak of Blue Mountain. And again, quite, quite mature forests, um, which mean that it will arrive at old forest and old growth earlier than a lot of forests in Vermont if, if left to its own devices. So the, the plan really is to, um, to let it become old growth and uh, that will take a long time, but as I said, not quite as long as many properties in Vermont. Um, our um, vision for it is to keep it largely for pedestrian wandering around, basically. We're not gonna create a lot of recreational infrastructure there. In fact, it'll be just a property that people can visit and, and understand the, the beauty of, of old forests and how different they are from forests that are harvested repeatedly. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Susan Morse. Sue is an ecologist, professional wildlife tracker, educator, and author. She is the founder and science director of Keeping Track, a nonprofit that serves to engage communities in monitoring wildlife and their habitats. Teams that Sue has trained have conserved more than 40,000 acres of land throughout North America. Great. Welcome, Sue. Pass it off to you. All right. Well, those of you who know me or know of me know that I don't even use computers and, and uh, this whole PowerPoint business and, and more recently Zoom is, is totally new to me. So having said that, I, I'm just going to give a hearty thanks to Sophie for, for, for being at my side on all of this. And, uh, uh, and of course, we are very indebted to Northeast Wilderness Trust for hosting not just tonight's program, but a couple more in the future. So keep your ear to the ground. All right, so enough said, we're going to start and um, 
when Alice called me, she was really searching for answers. She, she knew me, she knew of my training. Her husband actually took my training years ago and she knew that, you know, she could reach out to me and, and I'd be there for her and I was. And it didn't take us long to, to realize that really what she was, is not unlike thousands of people all across our great nation. She was preparing to grieve over the loss of her beloved landscape and the wildlife that lived there to the inevitability of development, the so-called highest and best use. I assured her it, it needn't, needn't be that way, that, that really people can make a difference and that if we could somehow find a way to work together, put our differences aside and really have a common vision for why nature is special and why it needs our help right now in a hurry, then let, we'll get something done. And I suggested that she might want to do what we have done in other parts of the state, the Chittenden County Uplands Project that Sophie mentioned and Cold Hollow to Canada and, and the Chattagee No Town Project, just to name a few, Orange County Headwaters, et cetera, et cetera. Bit by bit over the last decade, especially, uh, Vermonters are deciding, hey, we're not going to just give in to the inevitability of development. We're going to come up with some creative alternatives. So that's what we talked about. And I suggested that she has great habitat as a core there to work with. She obviously has neighbors that are already thinking about this. We heard Bob tell us about the history of, of one landowner's passion for this idea. And so suddenly it's really taking hold. And so I promised Alice that I, in lieu of a field trip that we didn't get to have together this December, that I would do this PowerPoint by way of wetting their appetites for the significance of monitoring wildlife in their region to learn who's who and where's where and why, why the wholeness of core habitat is critically important to Vermont and to the world right now and why connective habitats are equally important, linking them together with other habitats and making a fabric of wildlife habitat that really works. So what I'm gonna to do tonight is we're just gonna think about a dozen species and we're gonna have a tracking lesson. <laughs> we won't be in the woods, alas, but we'll learn a few things. But let me assure you all that Alice and her neighbors are gonna be looking for wildlife. They're gonna be learning about how to read tracks and sign, how to understand animal habits and uses of habitat. And with all of this information in hand, they're gonna they're gonna grow and, and the land will be conserved because of their work. So bobcats, bobcats are like all cats, including our house cats. They're cryptic, they're hidden. They're creatures of stealth and stalking. They're not about speed. They're not running down their prey, not unless they're cheetahs anyway. Bobcats in particular really use cover. And so in my mind, the best habitats offer a mix of uh, softwood and hardwood, uh, but also what we call vertical cover or vertical diversity from the forest floor to the uppermost portions of the trees lots of vegetative cover to hide behind. This one's hunting a turkey, <laughs> which is actually me. And it's <laughs> going to go for the turkey. And you see the oak leaves bursting off the trees as it bursts through. And this is true for all the cats here in North America. They do this. And so as we think about bobcats and wanting to find evidence of their being in our woods, we have to think about what is it in their habitat do they really like? What kinds of cover? Well, certainly by the wetland edge where you have the sun reaching in and creating a whole layer of vegetation right there at the ground floor, juxtaposed with the water on one side and the woods and the cliffs and what have you on the other. This is really what bobcats are looking for. There's a lot of prey there and there's a lot of opportunity to sneak up on the prey. Same time, they like these cliffs. My experience here in New England and uh, the Adirondacks too is wherever you have these cliffy habitats, uh, 
this is where the bobcat can get away from enemies and be safe. And their kittens can be safe. And this is critically important. And we need to think about that because increasingly with more and more people, and I think this is true, especially since COVID, we're really wanting to get out there. We're really wanting to be in nature. And I totally applaud that. But I'm, I'm worried that we're overrunning nature in places with too much recreation, too much trail building, too much insistence on our being out there often at the expense of these animals that have lived there all their lives and lives of their species for generations, thousands of years in some cases. It's not a good mix. Uh, we, we definitely have scientific evidence that everything from nest fidelity for songbirds to, to uh, denning refugia are really intruded upon by the simple pedestrians, never mind uh, ATVs or bikers, horses, it's all the same. Too many of us out there uh, really winds up being extremely frightening for them and, and wrecks their energy budget, especially in a hard winter. So what do bobcats need? Well, they certainly need a diversity of prey. We, we know that they really like snowshoe hare in the north and cottontail in the more temperate habitats, but that's not all. They eat small rodents, woodchucks, rough grouse, to name just a few. So think about where these things are in your woods and look there. Again, that cover is critical. So if we own land, the worst thing we can do is mow right to the edge of our woods and cut down that intermediate growth that gives the predator and the prey a place to hide. Bobcats have really, uh, done well in recent decades in Vermont, and I personally have data on this, 45 years of data at Wolf Run in uh, northwestern Vermont, and the arrival, for example, in my state of the area of turkey and uh, uh, squirrel, gray squirrel, neither of which were there in the mid-70s, has really been a boom to bobcat. And so as snowshoe hair numbers may have declined as the forest has matured, these new species have more than made up the difference. Now, I can remember when nobody believed we had any lynx in New England, and I served on a committee out west called the Western Forest Carnivores Committee, and my colleagues were all just thumbing their noses at the notion that we could have a population of lynx anywhere in New England. And, and yet I knew different. I deer hunt up in northern Maine, and I was seeing lynx tracks every time I went up there. Well, sure enough, with time, Maine fish and wildlife biologists proved that we not only had lynx, but we had the largest breeding population of anywhere in the lower 48. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> so let's learn about lynx. Lynx and bobcat look similar, but look at those ear tufts. Right there. Bobcat's ear tufts are nowhere near that big. And also the tail tip is solid black. Bobcat's tail tips will be intermediate, intermittent colors, and bobcat will have a longer tail than a lynx, interestingly enough, and the underside of that tail will be white. Lynx, from the hock down to the foot, the color of the leg will be pretty much the same color as the inside color of the animal, tan or silver. Bobcats will be chocolate brown or black. Look at those ear tufts. That's classic lynx. No bobcat would ever have ear tufts like that. So what do you think? What is this animal? Bobcat or lynx? Look at the legs. From the hock down to the foot, look at the tail tip, look at the ear tufts. It's a lynx. What do you think this animal is? This is clearly a bobcat with a mix of colors at the tail tip, not solid black, a longer tail, and definitely that white on the underside is a giveaway. Quiz, what is this animal? This is a bobcat, you bet. What do you think? Lynx? 
Now, when we teach tracking and keeping track, we have people looking at feet. We have a whole trunk of animal free stride mammal feet. We look at what I call the foot morphology and we learn quickly that cats, from house cats to Bengal tigers, have an asymmetrical foot morphology with a leading toe. If you turn your right hand upside down and get rid of your thumb and look at your four fingers, your middle finger is what I call the leading toe. It sticks out ahead of the others. And now, if you look on the outside, that small toe is your little finger. It's physically smaller than the other three and it's lower down on the finger arrangement. The thing to remember is with cats, if you drew a straight line across any toe, it's not going to line up with any other toe. It's fundamentally asymmetrical. The palm pad at the top is bilobed. It's got a little bit of a cleft right here. And so oftentimes in a tract, you'll see an M shape here. Repeat after me, M for meow. Lynx, cousin Lynx, and I, I discovered this and the Forest Service published uh, my, the results of my work. The lynx has a totally different foot. Not even the snow leopard has a foot like this. It has tiny little toe pads and it's very small, asymmetrical. That means these two lobes are lower than the center lobe palm pad, but it's tiny. And the rest of this is, guess what, fur. So this is really analogous to the webbing or decking of your snowshoes. It's, it's far better for flotation to have fur there than open pad features, probably warmer too. And so feet are made by, tracks are made by feet in other words. And so here you see all this middle furriness with no pad features showing. We call that negative space in tracking. So that's a lynx track. Here is an unusual occurrence that I found in Alberta, Canada, when I was tracking mountain lions, radio collared mountain lions. That's bobcat on the left with a nice M there, M for meow. And you tell me, is that a right foot or a left foot? Bet, it's a left foot. And here's lynx. Is that a right foot or a left foot? It's left, good job. Bobcats have in many, many times in many substrates, providing there's a soft, fine layer, impressible layer on top of a harder layer, like this soft skiff of snow on top of a frozen beaver pond, you'll have what I call the hair halo. And that's this ruff of fur that encircles the tracks. So it's not part of the track impressions, it's just encircling it. I call it the hair halo. You won't see that in every bobcat track, but it's a giveaway in the right circumstances. Okay, so all cats are the same, I said, from house cat to Bengal tiger, except for lynx. I have to confess, I haven't seen an African fishing cat track, so I don't want to insist on that, but I strongly suspect that we're going to be looking at this, this signature. We're going to look at an M, and an asymmetrical arrangement of toes. And if it's the size of a quarter, it's a house cat. If it's the size of a golf ball or a little smaller or a tiny bit bigger, it's a bobcat. Clearly, that's not a house cat, not a bobcat track. I have never found one of these in Northern New England. That's a cougar track, otherwise known as panther, painter, Puma, mountain lion. When I was doing cougar research in Utah, my colleagues who were houndsmen helped me catch the lions. They call them deer slaying son bitch. <laughs> so they have a lot of names, but they're all the same animal. And there you can see the signature. You can see the M, you can see the lead toe. These animals will come back. Some have tried. And uh, no doubt in our listening audience tonight, there are people who believe they've seen pumas is a preferred common name, cougars, catamounts, all names for the same. And I do believe a percentage of people have seen these animals. For example, there was an animal that came all the way from South Dakota, went up through the, 
through uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and up into Canada and then down to the Lake George area. We don't know how it got from Lake George to Connecticut where it was finally killed by a car, but it made a journey of almost 2,000 miles. And no doubt dozens of people saw that animal. We know that many of the sightings of that animal were in fact of that same animal because DNA in feces that were collected or hair samples or urine coupled with remote camera photos of the animal as it made its remarkable journey, it was all the same critter. Is it going to stop at that? Well, no, there was a female that went all the way from South Dakota to Humphreys County, Tennessee. There was a cougar in Florida that went all the way from South Florida all the way up and around to Georgia. But here's my message. Part of what our work is about as conservation advocates is not just conserving habitat. We need to roll up our sleeves and get involved in advocating for these animals. We need these predators and they need to be protected. Unfortunately, a lot of these colonist cats that are trying to come east are getting shot on the journey. They're getting killed. All right, enough of that. Feet make tracks. We've learned that, right? So. What do you think this track is based on what we've learned already? Well, clearly that's a what track? That's a cat. And if I told you that that, uh, it's either a, a loblolly or a slash, I think it might be a slash pine cone uh, in Florida. That, that's a good uh, three inches long. No, that's, that's, that's a Florida panther. So here's what's not a cat. This animal has two forward toes. Oh, come on. That are straight across. I could draw a straight line across them. Two rear toes that I could draw a straight line across. Pardon my mouse, it's not behaving. And the palm pad, instead of being broad topped or bilobed, comes to a point like the pointed muzzle of a dog. With the result that this track is fundamentally symmetrical. And I can draw an X, and that's the way I teach it. And I've been published in this all over the country. Look for the X. If it's a canid, you're going to see an X. You can see where that X goes. And in this case, that's wolf. That's coyote. What do you think? Is that a cat or a dog? Dog. Yeah, you see the nail mark that I have circled, but many times you don't get to see that. So don't just rely on that because that's going to lead you astray. Look for the X. The other thing to look for is this squared off inside edge of the rear toes. Cats have teardrop shaped toes. This squaring off of the inside edge is classic dog. In that case, coyote. So what do you think? That's my boot print. These are even bigger than that cougar was. This is Timberwolf in northern Minnesota. Big dog. Okay, now, quiz. What is that? Look for the signatures. Look for the leading toe. Look for the little toe. Look for the M for meow. Hmm, what do you think? Well, here's rule number 9, 10, 11 in tracking. Don't just look at one track and, in fact, gather all the evidence. In this case, the slobber-covered tennis balls tell us that that's my neighbor's dog, whose track wants us to think it's a cougar track. So beware of that. Don't just look at one, and one track. Now, this is what I specialize in, and this is what my research has been about for now, almost 50 years, scent marking. This is a, a whole range of behaviors that all these animals do to communicate with one another. And this bobcat is doing something that bobcats and cougars both do. So if they live in our woods, we should find sign of this. This cat is making what we call a scrape. It's planting its front feet firm, it's bringing its hind feet up behind the front feet, and then it's scratching back first one hind foot, then the other, and it's making 
a rectangular trough. This is a remote camera picture I have of one of hundreds at Wolf Run of one of, the, well, the third generation of toms that I've been studying. This is Mystery, and he's making a scrape. And you see his right hind foot is in motion. He's going to scratch back with that. He'll scratch back with the one next to that. He'll make that rectangular trough. It will culminate in an absorbent little relief of piled needles and leaves. And he may give it a spritz of urine. He may even defecate on it for extra measure, but really the scent that he's leaving on that scrape comes from glands between his toes called interdigital glands. And that's powerful scent. And it speaks volumes about who he is and what his social and reproductive status is at any given time. Here he's investigating a spray mark that another cat had made. Here he's going to facially mark the spray mark. There's glands on his forehead. There's glands around his lips. That's called facial marking. Look how long his tail is. Look at that white on the tail. That's clearly a bobcat. You'll notice he's not very spotted and barred like the pictures in the Audubon books. Our Northeastern bobcats look like this, pretty much. Here he's getting ready to give a little spritz so that is a classic bobcat scrape, and it goes like this. So the width of that scraped trough is roughly a couple of inches, a little bit wider than the width of the two feet side by each, and it culminates in a pile. And yeah, you'll sometimes see feces there, but don't be disappointed if you don't see it. Here's a mountain lion scrape, exact same animal, only a lot bigger. That Rectangular trough is roughly the width of two cougar paws side by each, much bigger than bobcat. But these things are ubiquitous in cat country, and you just have to know that they like to do these things where the substrate is abundant and available, but in particular, where that substrate is in a unique situation that calls attention to itself. It might be an intersection of two game trails, it might be underneath a ledgy overhang where it's protected from the elements. Spray marks can be made anywhere, but they really like to happen underneath something that's protected. It may just be a leaning rotten stump that's protecting itself because it's leaning. So if you see four bobcat tracks stop and back up to something, smell there. It smells like the cat box, that really pungent, acrid smell. A little spritz happening. I call it in your Facebook. And she's saying, oh, yes, I remember him. He was a lusty one. I wore him out, though. We had such wonderful kittens. He didn't help. So the dogs, they're, they're, they're very cooperative. And our coyotes are not unlike their wolf cousins. They are family packs. They're not extended packs, but they operate in a pack structure. And uh, fathers are devoted to their offspring and help their mates with providing food. They're a remarkable creature. They first came into our region here in Vermont in the 40s, but first made their journey from the Midwest up into the Canadian uh, habitats in Algonquin Park region. And, officially in 1990, 1919, where they hybridized with uh, a small wolf called the Eastern Canadian timber wolf. It's different than gray wolf. And so our coyote is a hybrid involving coyotes, a little bit of dog, but it really shouldn't be called coy dog, but as it turns out, wolves in the Arctic North have a little bit of dog in them, probably because they hybridized with sled dogs from the Inuit. So we can't go anywhere with that. But this coyote wolf uh, hybridization is unique and special. And that's why our coyotes are bigger and have more color morphs. And they their muzzles are broader and their chests are broader and their teeth are more wolf-like. And so in a lot of ways, they've picked up a lot of wolf stuff that really equips them to be a capable predators of deer, although that's certainly not how they make a living. 
They eat a lot of fruit and everything else out there too, more than wolves do. This is dad coyote getting ready to regurgitate for the little one. I call that the hot lunch program. Mm -hmm. So these classic coyote tracks, you can really see how you can draw an X through those tracks. Yes, you can see the nail marks, but don't be disappointed if you don't. Mm -hmm. For example, <laughs> you know, you'd be hard pressed to really be sure what you're looking at here, but it's a coyote. <clears throat> Hands down, the two most important items I find in coyote feces in over 45 years of collecting and analyzing are cherry species. And this is true for all the mesocarnivores out there from coyotes and raccoons to foxes. Cherry species, including uh, pin cherry, choke cherry, and black cherry, and apples. So they, they go to the edge of my woods and they find the wild apples and they love them. This is red delicious, don't you think? <laughs> this has got to be golden delicious. This is coyote stuff. They love it. So do fishers, a lot of these animals. But make no mistake about it, they're eating nuts. They, they love beech nuts. These are coyote scats full of beech nuts. This is a scent marking behavior that wolves and coyotes both do. It's called scratchbacks, where they take the front feet and hind feet and they vigorously scratch back. Perhaps some of you have seen your domestic dog do that. They're marking with the interdigital glands primarily and they're creating a visually conspicuous uh, come look at me kind of thing. But you can also see the urine on the log. The raised leg urination is scent mark. Shifting to gray fox, uh, more and more people are seeing gray fox in the valley habitats. Uh, they used to be pretty much limited to the Champlain Basin, but they're they're definitely expanding now. We're not going to see them in the higher terrain, the up the really upland upland habitats, but um, they're. Uh, Tails are dark along the top and culminate in a dark tip. Mm. Their coat is always, 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 always salt and pepper gray. And then highlights of reddish orange on the neck and the throat and underneath and the insides of the legs sometimes. They're beautiful animals. They have a shorter faces, shorter legs, shorter torsos, and shorter tails than red fox. And they cannot breed and hibernize. So they're two entirely different foxes. And it's really kind of special that we have both. And uh, I love them. I associate gray fox with mature hardwood habitats. And yes, they'll come to the edge, the farm field edge, especially in the valley habitats and avail themselves of fruit. They're very frugivorous, as we say. They eat a lot of insects. But notice those nails. This is a fox we radio collared and studied in the, in the Marin Headlands in California coast. Those nails are made for climbing. And that's what they can do. No other Canid has wrists that can rotate the way the gray fox can, and uh, they can climb trees. And where they originated, according to fossil records, it's believed uh, they climb trees for fruit. You know, Mexico, Central America. One thing you'll see in a really good gray fox track is how those very fine nails arch forward and insert themselves into the substrate and where they do, they are tiny. That's a pine needle that I've stuck in that to show you that. The other thing you'll notice is what my friend and colleague Paul Resendez calls the winged ball. This is a ball-like feature in the hind foot's palm pad or technically planter pad and these are the wings. And that's unique. No other canid has that. Kind of reminds me of lynx, except that those wings are more straight out. Red fox is altogether different, thank you. And it's uh, it's not always red like this, although most of the ones we see here in New England are. It always has that white tip tail, though. So that's what you look for if you're sure you're seeing 
a red fox. It often has the black stockings, but again, not always. The feet are very different than gray fox and coyote and wolf. The feet are covered with fur. And so they kind of remind me of lynx. They have tiny little toes and a tiny little boomerang shaped palm pad. And in this case, this is a hind foot. So this would be the planter pad. And the rest is all fur, just like lynx. We see red fox right up into the Arctic. Where I go in the Arctic, I see them regularly. That is a beautiful red fox track in mud. You'll notice the negative space between the tiny toes and the boomerang compact. These are red fox tracks in winter and the lower track where the knife is pointing points at the delicate nails, but especially look at that slit uh, at the bottom of that. There's a lot of negative space between the toes and that hint of an impression of the, of the planter pad. Very delicate nails. They're beautiful animals. And this is the animal that I think most often people mistake for cougar. Because when this, when these animals are really holding forth in the summer and, and the pups are just old enough to really start wrestling with one another and trying to be dominant and, and then trying to find mom, they do a lot of vocalizations that people are sure are cougars because they sound like women getting strangled. Well, that's red fox. And if you do that back, they'll sit there on their haunches and look at you. Now, this is a color phase of red fox that I filmed up in, in uh, New Brunswick, Canada. And this is called a cross fox. It's so named because it has kind of a black cross that crosses uh, the shoulder line with the backbone. And this is another color phase that I filmed in northern Quebec. This is, uh, some call it a silver fox. It's a black fox, but it's a really a red fox. It's just a color phase. And one litter will have uh, examples of all of them in it. So it's not, you know, it's not something that is limited to uh, something. This is classic red fox behavior. And again, if you want to find red fox sign, go to the field edge where there, you know there's lots of rodents, preferably in a field that hasn't been mowed to nubbins at the end of the summer season, leaving wildlife with nothing. If I have nothing else to say, please don't do that. Leave that thatchy, thickety, grassy environment because that's where all kinds of animals have made their investment in a home for the winter. And that's where all kinds of other animals are gonna be looking for them to eat. This fox is looking to eat and look at the tail of the mouse in the mouth, down the hatch. And by the way, I'm dedicating these fox pictures to Alice because I know she's got a soft spot for red fox. That's a rat. Uh, they eat all manner of small mammals. Uh, they will eat woodchucks. Uh, they eat a lot of fruit. They're all over the fruit. And I will say that it's important that we offer wildlife a diversity of habitats from the oldest old growth structurally to, to some young forests and field edge habitats too, uh, because, because there's food there for all these animals. And what would be really exciting is if your conservation initiative brings it all together with core habitats of wild, forever wild habitats that will always be sanctuaries for wildlife mixed with these wonderfully productive valley habitats and even the edges of our farms. It's all good. It isn't good if you get shot at on site. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're missing our apex predators here in the North Country. Well, because people didn't like them then and they were systematically eliminated. And they're, for that matter, their prey was systematically eliminated. So it was hard for a catamount to make a living here in the 19th century. But things are changing and our forests are, are really productive. And I will tell you, we have more contiguous forests of forests than any place in the lower 48, the entire Northeast. So we are poised for predator recovery.
and that will be good. And by the way, if you think you're seeing a cougar, look for that because bobcats don't have that enormous puffy long tail. For them to survive here, they will need to have real sanctuary. And that's why I love the work that the Wilderness Trust is doing because those lands will be conserved forever. It won't be in somebody's better judgment in the future to liquidate the forests on those lands, to kill the wildlife because they're bad, on and on. No, consider that. If you're considering what to do with your land, seriously, give that one some thought. For lack of connectivity with other, in this case, panthers, which is our southeastern name for cougar, uh, these animals were, were really going to blink out when I first started going to Florida and doing some of my work down there, these kittens weren't necessarily making it to adulthood. They were dying of, of uh, heart murmurs and birth defects and reduced sperm motility. They couldn't reproduce uh, well. Uh, they had a higher uh, susceptibility to infectious diseases. And this was all because they were inbred. So one of the things that rewilding is all about in our great nation, uh, posited by Northeast Wilderness Trust here in the East and the Wildlands Network throughout the country and other organizations too, including Keeping Track, is that we need to rewild, we need to reconnect Louisiana and Arkansas with Texas and Florida. Do you follow me? And they artificially did that by bringing into Florida when they realized what was going on, they brought in just eight Texas female cougars and let them go to be bred by Florida panther males. And overnight, these problems went away. So it was a good thing, but we need to do more. So you recognize that, of course, that's called a scrape or a scratch. And that's made by a cougar, much, much bigger than the bobcat. And if you take pictures of these things, if it's going to become part of your data, try to have some things in the picture to give you a sense of scale. A scrape or a scratch sometimes in eastern habitats really wants to end up in a pile of leaves or a pile of pine needles. I find scrapes in the American West on ridge lines where there might just be two trees, two pinion trees all by their lonesome, and underneath those pinion trees will be enough needles to make a scrape, and the cats know that. And this is where they read the messages about each other's status in space and time. Uh, everybody loves the fisher, but this, this is not a cat. It's a member of the weasel family. Notice those round ears and that pointed face, not at all like a cat. A big record weight male might weigh around 20 pounds, 18 pounds, 17 pounds. Female might weigh 10, 12, even 13, 14 pounds. They're tough hombres. They are not mean. They're not going to hurt you. They're really remarkable. They never were extinct in Vermont, but they were going to go there for sure were it not for a combined effort of fish and wildlife and forests and parks, both that wanted to bring back uh, this animal for its natural ability to control porcupine numbers. And it was a stunning success. Porcupines might not have been too happy about all that, but they were, you know, overrunning certain hardwood forests because the predators that had always been known to take a percentage of porcupines and keep their numbers in check, if you will, were fishers and guess who else? Cougars. Well, we got rid of both pretty much. So the porcupines are now watching their backs. <laughs> fishers have an interesting habitat. They will have it. They will cache prey and uh, they will take uh, their prey, uh, especially if it's if, if it's big, uh, and uh, take it up and hang it in a tree. And this was put here by a female fisher, and she had her den tree right next door. So it was like having Hannaford's across the street. And she fed off of this red fox for over a week. And I monitored that from a respectful distance. 
I think the fox must have died of old age. That muzzle's pretty gray. Fishers eat a lot of fruit and in that capacity are really essential for for biodiversity in the plant community, and as a consequence, all the things that everybody else eats. This is mountain ash, and this is mountain ash in a fisher scat. And so when you find something like this, if you have a, a, a way of doing it, break, o break open one of those fruits and look at the seeds. They all look different, and you can sort out that that was mountain ash. And so, you know, viburnum, and uh, hazelnut, Beech nuts, fishers eat all of this, all the cherries. The cherries are very, very important in their diet. Now this is fun, scent marking again, I can't help myself. Those what look like holes on the hind feet are called plantar pad glands and they're actually little reservoirs, but emerging from those reservoirs are stiff hairs that kind of stick, stick above the surface of the, the skin of the palm, in this case, the plantar pad and convey to that surface secretions from the glands within. And their tracks are unique. They're five-toed tracks. Uh, the carpal pad is unique for them on a front foot. They're just like a bear, so you look for that. Now here's the scent marking going on. You see where the knife is pointing? They like rotten logs and they especially like what I call pokey uppies, which are rotten stumps that stick up. And you see there's urine on that, but there's more, you see, because they're rubbing their groins. They're rubbing their genitalia. They're rubbing and rubbing and they're leaving a message. It, it's really quite exciting. And I have thousands of pictures of male and female fishers scent marking on these pokey uppies. This is a pokey uppy and what you're looking for when you think you've found them is evidence of some urine and certainly some hair. If you're gonna rub on these things, you're gonna leave hair. So the trick is, if you're out tracking and you're tracking fisher tracks, if it goes to a pokey, pokey uppy, get down on your knees because you won't see the, air, the hair from above. You have to really look close and take a picture of it. That's your evidence. That's what you can take to court. <laughs> They're beautiful animals and uh, very bright. They love rose hips. <laughs> they love beech nuts. Scientists in Maine have found that there's what they call reproductive synchrony. In years of high be uh, beech mass production, there is high fisher kit and marten kit and bear cub production. They all, they all benefit from this abundance of beech nuts. Beautiful animals. Okay, mink, cousin mink, also a mustelid or mustelid, and this is a much smaller animal and more associated with wetland habitats. That's a buck mink or male. He has a very different physique than the female that's slender. Uh, he's got what I call a Sylvester Stallone physique. He's thicker and his neck is thicker looking. His feet are really spread out. That's a beautiful buck mink. We often see them around habitats in the wetlands and beside the wetlands that feature a lot of cattails. Um, one, of their, one of their key prey animals that they focus on at times is the muskrat that makes use of that aquatic vegetation. But they eat all sorts of things. This female mink is running off with a gosling they're beautiful animals. And here's where our recreation can really get in their way. If we care about wildlife in our communities, we need to remain very, very attentive to plans to develop more and more and more and more recreational trails along our rivers everywhere. And the argument is, oh, we're going to clean up the river edge. It's full of shopping carts and trash and, and, and uh, all that old tires. Leave it alone. Yes, you can clean the trash up, but leave all that woody debris and leave that confusion at the river's edge just the way it is, because that's where these animals live and make a living. 
Mink have, for the bustle, it's very unusual feet. They're very, what I call, naked and clean. Not a lot of fur obscuring those pads. Hence, that's what we see in the tracks. They're very clean, star-like little tracks that are beautiful to find. They're, they're really different. No fisher would ever look like that. No weasel would ever look like that. No wolverine. Otters are a joy, and they are all about fun. And they're much bigger than the mink and much bigger than the fisher. They're our biggest member of the weasel clan in our region. They live a very strong semi-aquatic lifestyle, more so than the mink. Uh, they're feeding on all kinds of slow-moving fish, bottom feeders, we call them, and uh, uh, crawfish, crayfish, as we say. Their bodies are Johnny Weissmuller plans with really heavy tails and very muscular torsos for swimming. Great big, broad, flipper-like feet, hind feet especially for swimming. And this is what their feet are like. If, again, feet make tracks. Notice from nail to nail, just below the nail, at the what we would call the halfway point of the toe length, will be this webbing. That's called mesial webbing. And so that's what we should see in tracks. And you can see, you know, where these toes are held together with this webbing. What time is it? Okay. One thing I discovered, and, and I, to my knowledge, I, no one else has really written about this, but this uh, toe on the on the hind foot of of, uh, of otters is really long, and my my theory for that is when I think about it is that it's that way on purpose that it's really kind of like a bat wing. It, it, it when it stretches out, it really super enlarges the totality of that hind foot with still more webbing and. You know, it's not unlike the flippers we used to use in the swimming pool to get around. So here's a good picture of the hind foot with the plantar pad glands showing. And uh, so these are the actual plantar pad glands. And they're very swollen here because it's the reproductive season. They make what we call grass twists, which are, they'll take their feet especially and shape these things and in so doing, put scent secretions on there, but then they will often defecate and urinate associated with these things. And to elevate the grasses this way is, in my, my way of thinking, just a way of making their message look conspicuous. When we look at their spray piles where they're routinely coming and defecating, we can see their diet. We can see the exoskeleton fragments of crayfish, which curiously turned pink, uh, but on the right we can see the fish scales of the fish they eat. They're famous for this, mm -hmm. and I think it was Cicero who said in Latin, which I can't repeat verbatim, but something to the effect, the otter, he is quick to play, and indeed they are. This is one dog otter that went back and forth doing this because he could. And this one this one was 26 feet long, one glide. We all know kids that do that, right? Chances are we did that. Okay, moose. As we wind the show up, we can't forget the moose. It'll surprise you to know that we had about 200 moose in all of the North Country at the turn of the 20th century. And by the time you got into the 80s and mid 80s and before they started declining, we easily had 100,000 moose in our region, including places like Connecticut. So they expanded extraordinarily, and it was exciting. We all were very, very excited about it. And indeed, we should have been. They're really an amazing critter. Well, I'm not convinced we're gonna lose moose in our region because I think our mountains give us an edge on that over, say, for example, Minnesota, which is losing their moose. And our mountain habitats really give them 
uh, a way to uh, ameliorate the hardships of hot summers, which is a problem for them because it causes them to not eat well. And when they become too numerous, as we see here in northern Maine, especially the industrial forest country where we were artificially stimulating excessive populations of moose with all this uh, early successional growth, it, it, it was out of hand. Because ask yourself, if you are a young moose going into your first winter, how can you possibly reach that vegetation? You can't. And then if you combine that, which this cow tried to do, with carrying 40,000 winter ticks on your body, you die, not of winter ticks, but of malnutrition. So it's a one-two punch. The loss of quality habitat in combination with ticks. That's my personal take on the subject. She had over 40,000 ticks on her, but really she died of malnutrition. Everything was shut down. She probably died of a massive heart attack. The ticks are nasty. We're having more and more of them because of climate change. Suffice it to say, the ticks are getting in a leg up on moose because of warmer falls and warmer springs. But we need quality habitat. So here again, we neighbors in our communities, we care about moose. We need to help our fish and wildlife departments think this one through and think about how hunting really truly can be used as a management tool that... <laughs> Can I turn that back off? Yeah. It's um, as a management tool that will keep moose numbers in check and provide healthy meat for the families that want it, uh, and, but, but really safeguard uh, the, the habitat. Too many moose are not good for their own habitat. We know that. So there's where conservation advocates in our communities really need to roll up their sleeves and help fish and wildlife. They want public input. Let's give it to them. You all know moose sign. There's no deer that would make that much. It's just common sense. That's a lot. <laughs> and this is a moose rut holes where a, a bull moose dug out with his four feet a shallow depression in typically wet ground, sometimes at the wetland's edge, sometimes an old logging road. Then he urinated in that. He might very well have put a good two gallons of urine and that all, all that foamy broth is his urine. That's his track there next to my knife. And then what he's gonna do is he's gonna splash that stuff all over his face and his neck and his bell and especially his antlers. And he's gonna just perfume himself with odeur de mousse. And it turns out the testosterone rich urine speaks volumes to cow moose about his uh, suitability as a potential mate. Cows have been known to come kick bulls out of their wallows and lie at themselves. Bulls will then take their urine-soaked necks and their antlers and make these. These are called rubs. They want to be visible, but trust me, if they're brand new, you'll sometimes see hairs on there and they will smell like urine. This is not associated with antlers. This is done with the teeth. This is called barking or bark stripping. And in our woods, this happens mostly on red maple and striped maple. We also see this happening to mountain ash. They're eating what's in the inner bark. It's essentially what they're doing. This happens in the fall and then again in uh, winter, late winter especially, and spring, when the sap is in the stem. Old scars on the left and a healed over scar on the right. You've all seen this. This is all done by moose. Here the moose tried to do the limbo. When the moose is six foot tall at the shoulders and it goes under a snag and is too, it can't bend that low, this is what sometimes is left behind. So careful trackers are always on the look for hair. Bears are really uh, ambassadors of wilderness and wildness here in New England. We have lots of bears here. We're very fortunate. And uh, they need it all. They definitely need habitats in which they can be left alone, however. So we need to be mindful of the value of big, old, dark, 
private forests without a lot of human intrusions because bears, especially mother bears with their youngsters, really need that. This is a Florida black bear, but the, the message is the same. You can see that this obviously is the arch, right, of the foot. This is a hind foot of a bear, and that would be the arch, okay? So everybody take your left foot and arch your arch. Now, wiggle your big toe. If you were a bear, your big toe would be on the opposite side of the foot. It would be on the outside of the foot. So that's one way you could tell black bears from your barefooted neighbor. Hmm. Our bears' uh, nails will never be as long as, as grizzly or brown bear, but they sometimes really show in a track and add an exciting element to it. They're really eating a lot of fruit out there, all the fruit you can think of and all the nuts too. That's really what they're doing. They're really 99, 9 tenths percent of what they're eating is, is from plants. And when they eat these plants, they spread more. So they are really beneficiaries, if you will, of, of everything from wax wings to martens because all these flat disc-shaped seeds of the various viburnum species that grow into new viburnums are supporting wildlife, all wildlife, including the cedar waxwing. And of course, bears love those apples. Oh boy, they are great. And they help spread more. Don't you think some of those seeds are going to go to town? You bet. You all probably have seen this on beech trees where they climb the beech trees to get to the fruit up high. They climb cherries and they climb mountain ash. In this case, those pre molars are going to fit right in that mark because they broke that branch in order to get to the fruit. And then we find these things, we call them bear nests, which is a misnomer. They're not really nests at all, but there are piles of broken branches that they sit beside and eat the beech nuts. This is the biggest bear nest I've ever found. And it was in my own woods. I was deer hunting at the time. I ran home, got my camera, left my gun at home. And, uh, I calculated in a nest like this or a couple nests, there could have been thousands of beech nuts that bears could have accessed just simply by sitting there eating them one by one like potato chips in a bowl. And you'll notice that bear nests are unique. They're not like ice storm damage. The branches are broken and pulled into a central location from multiple directions. Ice storms don't do that. You all see what I'm pointing out here? That's pretty cool. This is my specialty bear scent marking. Um, the dot on the left is where the upper, one of the upper teeth front canines anchored itself into the wood, bit into it and anchored, probably got to here. And then the dash is the long gash created by the what I call the action of the bite. The actual bite made by the lower jaw is what makes the dash. My students have named it in my honor. They call it bear morse code. Mm -hmm. So the dot dashes are a bear's means of creating what I call a scent repository that holds onto and delivers the scent molecules associated with the saliva and with uh, the sebaceous oils in the hair coat when the bear rubs the tree, if the bear does. The paws, the same. So how can you prove that this is a dot dash? Well, you could do the Sue Worth method. You can grab two little bear tooth-sized sticks and stick them in. If they come at one another from two different directions, you're looking at a bite that met in the middle. It's fun. I learned this from my skull. I took it for a walk decades ago. <laughs> I had to recreate this. I, I knew I knew that that was bare, that was obvious, but this, I don't know. That's the dash, that's the dot. So you look for that, you'll find it. Young people really enjoy reenacting the bare scene. 
So looking closely, you can see the dot dash, and there's where it is closed. They curiously do this to power poles, and often poles simply come right down to the edge of our remote rural roads and want to go on the other side. If there's a game trail that goes there and the bears are using it, look at that pole. It will be marked. Look at the spur, where the spur from the line's been created, this upright splinter. That's a perfect place to look for hairs that got stuck there when the bear rubbed the tree, which it does. So this is going on all around us, uh, both sexes. Uh, even youngsters will play at this. I don't know how much they're actually doing, but you can do a lot to record this evidence, uh, evidence by taking pictures. Look at this tree. It's gotten bitten many times, but those sticks tell all. Wetlands are key for bears and Here's why I love the Adirondacks. I love the wilderness in the Adirondacks, and I want us to have more of it here in Vermont and New Hampshire and, and all throughout New England. I want more wetlands. I want more of these greening sedges and spring forbs and spring, because this is key for bears. And this bear in my woods at Babysitter Swamp is all about the wetlands. And I see sign of bears there all the time in both seasons, spring and fall, curiously. There's stuff going on in fall, too, which is interesting. But definitely in spring, this is a babysitter tree, and I've named it this. And I've conserved this land with the Northeast Wilderness Trust, and I'm so glad I did. Years ago, it was one of the early, early, early projects when yeah. Kathleen Fitzgerald first founded the Trust. And I wanted these trees to be preserved forever. I didn't want anybody to second guess my judgment that these trees should remain here for bears, for generations, generations of bears and generations of trees. Why do baby bears like them? Well, look at that ladder-like spacing of branches, easy climbing, the thick foliage up high is shade from the hot sun. Where's mother? She's in that wetland next door eating those sedges. It's the only game in town, but you're safe. And that's important. But when she comes back, she'll oof, oof you down, and you'll come down, and you'll nurse right there, and you'll feel that warm sun on you. It may still be patches of snow all around you in the woods, but this is, this is heaven on earth. And from that moment on, all these infant bears have an affinity for these big trees. I'm not talking baby trees or medium trees. I'm talking about big evergreens because they associate them with their safety and their comfort. Ah, we're going to wind up the show with whitetail. People are excited about whitetail. That is a big buck rub. And rubs for bucks are about communication. He's got glands on his forehead glands between his antlers that he will deliberately rub on those rubs. And so he will mark that rub with his scent signature. That's the reason. In so doing, bucks are stimulating in does the onset of their estrus. So they're being primed, if you will, by him. It's called biostimulation. But make no mistake about it, because they're doing it to him, too, every time they urinate. So this is why big wild places are really cool, because the bigger, older bucks can get to be bigger and older, because the woods are bigger and remote, and it's just exciting. There's a lot more going on here. They make scrapes where they mark with their saliva and glandular secretions from their nostrils as well as secretions from their forehead glands. Here's a scrape where he broke the branches with his antlers, scraped the ground to leave scent from his tarsal glands. This is a lot of information here, but suffice it to say, this is, this is, uh, this is the New York Times for deer. It says all. It's the ultimate socials column. In between the hooves, there's glandular secretions from intradigital glands. 
And when we look at where they made a scrape and broke a branch with their antlers, we'll often find the hairs there. So tracking is looking close for sure. So as we conclude the show, we, we must really think bravely. And I think with all the love in our hearts about what the future could be. I remember when there were no moose in my woods. I remember when there were a few fishers. I remember when there were no gray squirrels and turkeys. And all of that has changed in just a handful of decades. What can happen here now in the next 50 years if we all get to work on this? There are wolves in Maine. That's recently been proven. And I will tell you, having experienced this in Montana, I was there when they first arrived. Washington State, I was there when they first arrived. And now more recently, states like Oregon and Arizona. And it's incredible, Colorado. Wolves, when they get established, they're going to be here with or without their passports. That will be ex exciting development, but we must have the habitat for them or it won't work. This is the Eastern Canadian timber wolf, very different than the gray wolf. Smaller, often more colorful, red like this. Exciting neighbors to have. I wish I had more time to go into this in depth. Maybe we'll do another one sometime. This is scratchback, only this is wolf scratchback. And the scratchback enhances and calls attention to the feces. So it's like a, a one-two punch. And raised leg urinations. Uh, David Meesh, the famous wolf biologist, estimated that wolves could make 20 raised leg uh, urinations in a mile's walk if the territory really uh, stimulates that behavior. That's a lot. So hats off to the Blue Mountain Wilderness Alliance and hats off to all of you that want to give this some thought. We need all the help we can get. Thank you. Cheers. You mind if I turn the light on? No. Okay, so we'll have some Q&A. Okay, so let's start with a bear marking question. Okay. So we've got this question, do bears, when bears are making that bite in the tree, the Morse code, are they doing that to get at the inner bark, maybe for food or for marking it? It is definitely marking. Um, the, uh, and they'll do this to any number of trees, although curiously, uh, out of my data after about the first 25 years, I, I began to notice something that was interesting, that, that a little bit more than 76% of the thousands of bear mark trees that I had cataloged occur on just four species of tree. Mm -hmm. And they are in the order of frequency uh, of numbers are white birch, balsam fir, striped maple, and this tree is not very abundant in our woods, more so in the Adirondacks than here, but it's a, it, if it's not a plantation, and it is truly a wild uh, stand, uh, red pine will get hammered. They, okay. they really love to mark red pine. You can take that to the bank. Great. But they'll mark anything. And uh, I think what, what, what they're looking for is the same as what all these animals are looking for. They're looking for some substrate, either a tree trunk for a buck deer or, or um, a scraping environment for a bobcat that will be visually conspicuous, that will be encountered with more frequency, hence the importance of an intersection of game trails. And uh, these are game trails, not necessarily our trails. Um, and, uh, and then sometimes the substrate itself, uh, the inner bark of the tree being marked, will will have an olfactory um, importance to it too it'll, it'll smell strong and bears will notice it or that kind of thing yeah great, great. so look out for red pine um i think you'll like this question with the mention of wolves in maine um lindsay and i'm sure others would love to hear more about that of the the sightings of wolves yeah wolves it isn't maine. so much sightings i think you can all do what i did you can google the subject and you'll find 
that there's a very, very uh, tiny bit of information about confirmation based on scats and, and tracks. What they've done since then to follow up on it, and, and that actually was preceded by some other animals that they now realize in retrospect were probably wolves or wolf hybrids too. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, they're really, I think they're being uh, perfectly uh, understandably quiet about it and they want to learn more and they will and i know that that's what happened with the lakes i mean once they started to really apply themselves to sorting that one out it was it was extraordinary so i look forward to what they learn yes maybe we'll see more um this question could either be for both of you but i'll pitch it to bob first um, what kind of what kind of wildlife are present on the blue mountain 800 acre sanctuary that Northeast Wilderness Trust is trying to protect in Vermont? Oh boy. Well, I don't think we have a lot of data on that yet, but maybe Sue can help with it. Sue, maybe you could uh, tell us if you know anything that is likely to be there. Well, the Blue Mountain region is not really getting into any of the boreal forests or subboreal forests that we see say, for example, in the Northeast Kingdom, correct or not? Correct. Yeah, so Although, we, wouldn't, yeah. we wouldn't necessarily expect to see, for example, lynx or marten there, but they could pass through and they mm -hmm. have. And I believe, I, I, well, I have a client in, in uh, Fairley, Vermont, mm -hmm. which is more, t more temperate, I think, by a long shot than, than Rygate area. And he had marten there. So I would, I, I mean, you know, uh, I, I'm with you, Bob. I, there's no way we can just pull a, pull a rabbit out of a hat here and know with certainty until we go and look. And I think that's one of the things these citizens, um, Alice and her colleagues want to want to do. And uh, so to what degree we can help, we will, but uh, that, that comes later. Um, but I, I would expect you to have black bear for sure. A residential black bear. How yes. big? How big is the area? If you if you include all the adjoining wildlands. Well, the 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 land that we're purchasing is 830 acres or, or oh. thereabouts, and and there'll be a, you know the possibility that there'll be other folks interested in conserving their land. So we you know we might get a and, and there is there is a block of forest land that is not conserved necessarily, but that is that is not developed. That is probably well well over a thousand acres in that immediate area, and it's within a bigger block. So good, great. And we just got a comment from um, a neighbor in the vicinity of Blue Mountain saying they've seen foxes, turkeys, bear, moose, fisher, bobcat, deer, porcupine, to name just a few. Um, and the one time that I was there, I found a very heavily used bear bear marking cedar tree. And oh, I was yeah. looking for the yeah, Morse yeah. code. I couldn't quite see it, but there was a lot. Of, I could discern the, the claw marks very much. Yeah. Well, one thing bears will do with cedars, which which might confuse us, I think most of the time it's, it's scent marking. But the other thing they do do, and I've seen this in the Adirondacks, and I've seen this in northern Minnesota, is they will rake uh, cedars to get to the bark Mm -hmm. And they take the bark strips into their dens. Oh, there was it. All the claw marks were on a piece of, like a stripped off piece of bark, huh. or on the tree behind where a piece of bark had been stripped off. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, how about uh, bobcats and lynx in terms of the growth of their population? Are those increasing, declining, spreading? Again, we're we're not really privy to the absolute latest on what our biologists in Vermont think about mm -hmm. the status of lynx. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we're doing any kind of official research either, to, to, to be sure. Uh, but respectfully, I, 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 they, they definitely have their ear to the ground and they definitely have found evidence of lynx in a couple places. But as to what their status is, is today vis-a-vis -vis climate change, for example, and growing or declining uh, social hair numbers. I, I've not read any anything in the literature on that in Vermont. I would say that um, in Maine, the lynx are holding their own, but it's thought that with climate change and changing uh, forest management practices, featuring fewer 
clear cuts and more selection cuts that, uh, that there may be a reduction in snowshoe hair habitat. I don't know. Again, I can't comment on that. Mm -hmm. Bobcats are decidedly, I think, increasing in the area because, you know, as I said earlier, the, there's there's more opportunity. It, you gotta you gotta realize that in the seventies, okay, if you were a bobcat, you went into town, you got shot, you were bounty. Same with bears. Yeah. So we live in a very different world today, and these animals know it. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, in the case of bobcats, uh, they're bobcats in the suburbs of Shelburne. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and so as long as the food is at hand, and as long as they can find refugia nearby, you know, core woods that is not constantly intruded by people and dogs and, and everything else, they're fine. Great. So, uh, you know, now what could happen with diseases? Uh, we're finding in, in, in the West, uh, uh, cougars are showing up with plague. Okay. Yeah, cougars are dying of plague and rodent poisons. I mean, please, all of you, do not use mouse and rodent poisons because it doesn't end there. It, got, it gets out in the wildlife and hammers them. Find another way to control rodents. Hire yeah. a bobcat. <laughs> hire a bobcat. Hire, hire a short-tailed weasel. Yeah. <laughs> and that actually leads nicely into another question we have here from Michelle about, um, Michelle has heard of a disease in New York State that has been weakening deer and is wondering if you've heard about this. Yeah, epizoic hemorrhagic disease, otherwise known as blue tongue. And there's, I believe there's been a little bit of that found in Vermont, quite a bit of that in other places in, in North America. New Jersey got hammered by it. So yeah, it's it's real. There's even a rabbit hemorrhagic disease that I read in an article put out by New Hampshire, New Hampshire Fish and Wildlife's non-game program that they're keeping an eye on that because if, you, if that gets into New Hampshire, the way it is out west, for example, it's decimating rabbits out west. Um, it, it'll be a disaster for the New England cottontail, you know, which is endangered. That one comes in, guess what? Pets, trade and pets. That's how it gets here. Yeah. That's how it starts. Yeah, that's as, as I understand it. And if there's anyone out in the audience who knows for sure, um, yeah. Okay. So pet rabbits uh, from all over, uh, you know, um, that's that's a disaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with with other populations of um, wildlife in Vermont, and you mentioned like we see Martin moving through, do we know if Martin have um, firmly established population anywhere in the Green Mountains? There's some wonderful research going on at the University of Vermont and the professor there and his students, uh, you know, uh, have been, been looking at that. One thing that I believe I understand they found was that um, some of the genetics of some of the Martins they found as far fetched as the Northeast Kingdom mm -hmm. and even New Hampshire have markers for the Martins that were released in Vermont at an attempted restoration of Martin in Vermont that was done in Southern Vermont uh -huh. in the George Aiken wilderness area actually. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, does anybody have any more information on that? That's pretty neat. I wish that professor were nearby. Yeah. Uh, but you could Google uh, American, it's technically American Martin. You could Google that for Vermont and, and mm -hmm. read up on their work. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so there's sort of a two part question from Isabella that I'm going to start with the second part. Um, Isabella is wondering if there are any organizations in the West and Midwest that do kind of a similar thing to what Northeast Wilderness Trust does, which is um, while conserving wild places that won't be um, timber harvested, they won't be motor vehicle uh, destinations. Um, I can think of American Prairie Reserve, which I think is up in Montana. Um, and I think there's an organization in Oregon that's doing some similar work, though I'm forgetting their name. So Bob, Sue, do you know of any others in well, that region? Well, in Minnesota, one of the most famous bear biologists, uh, black bear biologists out there, I, I actually know him and have been afield with him, is Lynn Rogers. And he was working with the Forest Service at the time and he was studying bears and he was studying bears that were habituated to 
coming and accepting food from him in, mm -hmm. in a peaceful way. And then he could just simply reach out and put radio collars on. It was really amazing. And uh, he was learning that they were really using big trees, especially big pines for refuge trees. Mm -hmm. And refuge trees are different than what I describe as babysitter trees. Refuge trees are used as needed anywhere in the habitat by any bear, mm -hmm. but especially a female with cubs. Mm -hmm. And she'll just scoot them up the tree. And she has a mental map of her habitat where the mm -hmm. near, nearest big tree is. So he began to say the obvious, holy cow, we shouldn't be cutting down these big white pines. Because he realized that for whatever reason, probably white pine blister us and possibly uh, white pine weevil, they weren't regenerating. Mm. So the great big white pines of the Northwoods in mm. Minnesota were not going to make more of themselves. And he was arguing that we should be leaving them alone. And so he eventually went out on his own, but mm -hmm. the, not before he became very involved with a, an organization called the White Pine Society. Okay. And I believe they still exist. Okay. So it might be fun for some people to look into that. The White Pine Society, yeah. focused on Minnesota, Minnesota area. Maybe more than that, but yeah. Minnesota for sure. Great. Do any come to mind for you, Bob? I, I would have to do a little research because there are very few that, there are certainly not very many, if any, that focus solely on the kind of work that Northeast Wilderness Trust does. But there are organizations that are interested in Forever Wild and some that may focus pretty exclusively on the kind of work we do. I'd have to do a little research and be happy to, to share that um, with uh, the interested questioner. Yeah, we could include that in the follow-up email, yeah. certainly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, oh, and one, one person shared a link in the chat for folks who were interested in um, American Martins in Vermont, um, so that there's a link now in the chat if you want to uh, dive into that a little more. Great, thank you for that. Do you want to do one last question or wrap sure, it up? Sure, yeah. Okay. One more. Okay, so. Um, Let's hit that Brad Elliott guy. Okay, great. <laughs> Shout out to Brad. So Brad's curious. Um, he saw striped maple on a recent sale of conservation plantings and is wondering whether it has ecological values beyond as a good substrate for those markings. Well, the keys, all the maples, you know, their seeds uh, that we call keys are, are really, really important. And this was a big year for striped maple keys and red maple mm. keys both. And so I asked the squirrels and, <laughs> and all the small rodents what they think and birds too. Um, you know, the, the striped maple as, as a smaller stature tree in the understory, if you will, it plays a, an interesting role for, for the layers of life in the forest, you know, vertical mm -hmm. diversity, we call it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I love the tree. I love all of the trees like that, the striped maple, the eastern hop hornbeam, the American mm -hmm. hornbeam, and then, of course, all the viburnum shrubs that stand tall, like nannyberry. They're all, ask the birds what they think. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Great. So still valuable. Um, and Bob, I've got one more for you. Um, we've got an audience member, Brenna, wondering how much land Newt has conserved in New England and in Vermont so far. I don't have the exact breakdown in Vermont of land that has either a forever wild easement on it or we own in fee, meaning we oh, own right. it as a preserve or sanctuary. Got the number for Vermont right here. So it's just a little over 8,000 of that total number of 64,000 is Vermont based conservation. And that's across 10 different properties, including some horses, Baby babysitter swap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and my best friend, Phil Sharfstein, owns the <laughs> Hickory Run. Yeah. Right, right next door. Yeah. Um, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Okay. That's Thank good. you so much, Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. Um, and if you can't get enough, we will be doing another presentation with Sue yeah. on April 26th. More wildlife research, recent findings. Um, and our spring speaker series has kicked off tonight. We have um, three more, three events in April and another event in May. 
Um, so you can head to Northeast Wilderness Trust's website to find out about the rest of those events. We hope to see you at some more. Have a wonderful evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Thanks.